We are in Genesis chapter 26. And uh, I love the way it starts out. There was a famine in the land. And it's not, besides the first famine, when, when Abraham was there, you know, that was in the days of Abraham, Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. So here's, here's the thing with being a Christian. Here's the thing about being who we are. Um, our faith is always going to be tested, pushed, prodded, you know, removed, uh, because faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And uh, God's going to bring out the best in us through testing. Satan wants to bring out the worst of us in testing. So, you know, when, when Abraham was here and their famine came into the land, he went right down into Egypt. And it must be tempting for Isaac because he heads that way. He gets right to border town. He gets right to Gerar. And uh, we spoke last week about how we parents pass things off to our kids. They get some of us whether they want it or not, you know. And uh, our safest place is right in the middle of God's will. That's where his grace covers us. That's where his grace blesses us. That's where he holds us. And uh, unbelief, you know, when unbelief starts to talk out, it, it goes, how do I get out of this test? <laughs> Faith says, what can I get out of this test? So whole different things. So the famine comes. He heads south. He gets to border town, Gerar. And the boys, Esau and Jacob, must not be with them at this time. They're grown. They've probably got their own little establishments, their own little tents and stuff. So this, uh, this chapter is just Isaac and Rebekah. It says in verse 2, Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I tell you. You know, the situation's got to be bleak in the land, you know. Nothing's coming up. Nothing's growing. But this is the first appearance of the Lord to Isaac. He appears to him. God knows this about our lives. We're going to have some dry times. You ever have any of those? You know, you, you ever run dry? You ever get a little barren? <laughs> and he warns us not to go down to Egypt. Don't go back into the world. We need to stay you know, as Pastor Rick, my pastor, used to say, we need to stay under the spout where the blessings pour out. And that spout is, where has he placed you? Where has he called you? What has he been talking to you about? That is the place where the blessings pour out. That is where, even though there's hardship there, even though there's hard things that come there, that's the place. Verse 3, it says, Dwell in the land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all the lands, and I will perform the oath, oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all the lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now, last week we noticed how um, Jacob had Esau sell him his blessing. You remember that? This is the blessing he sold. This is the, the covenant. This is what, you know, the birthright comes with, is God's hand on your life. It's with you. It's God going to be with you. It's God's hand going to be with you. God is going to bless Isaac for Jacob's. No, God is going to bless Isaac for Abraham's friendship, for Abraham's, you know, relationship with him. It's the same way God is going to bless you because of Jesus Christ and the relationship there. Verse 6, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. 
we're never going to be able to run away from troubles. We have to face troubles. If you ever want to grow, growth takes place in the valleys. Growth takes place not on those mountaintops where we all love to hang out. It takes place in the valleys where, where stuff gets plowed up and chewed up and tore up. And, and uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 says this, But we also glory in tribulation. We also glory in tribulation. He's including you in that. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Are you like me? Have you ever come to these places and you're like, how many times I've just wanted to quit? <laughs> I've just wanted to, let's just pack it up and go back to something easy or something hard or, you know, someplace where I'm familiar instead of all of this other stuff. How much easier it would be? How many dry seasons have you walked through? How many times where it's just hard, it's just flat out painful? You just don't want to go through it or, or, or do that any longer. How many times have you ever been in a place like that? And yet, as I look back, I think of all of those times, and yet I am living such a blessed life today. I am so thankful. I'm full, so full of joy and just in such a great place. And I'm like, I would not be here if it weren't for those places. But here we find Isaac deciding to live on the very edge of life. <laughs> like so many Christians, like so many of us, it, it's, I want to live right on the border, you know? Just how close can I get to that line without crossing over? You know, I know that getting drunk is wrong. I, I know that's a sin, but I, I still like to drink. So how many drinks can I drink? And you, you're doing all this experimentation. You know, you're, you're trying it all out. Just how close can I get to the edge without falling off the edge? I want to be as carnal as I can and still be saved. <laughs> that can be a place where we can settle. Notice it says he dwells there. That's not a good place to dwell. It's not a good place to set up camp and live. What that should tell us, if that's where we're living, is we've forgotten what Jesus has done for us. We've forgotten what the Lord came and did. We're to be separate. And it's, in the Bible, it's not separate from. I mean, so many people say, well, I don't, I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't go out with the girls who do, you know. And, and they're saying, that makes me separate. I'm sorry, that's the wrong separate. It's not separate from, it's separated unto. It's separated unto something. Just watch somebody that's in love. And they are separated unto each other. You know, it's, it's funny because you'll watch people and, and you'll see them come in. They're wearing the same shirts and they're hugging each other and they're smiling and, you know, they're doing all of that stuff. The guys actually put on deodorant and, you know, steaks, combed his hair, you know. There's all of this stuff going on. And the girl, she spent a little long time in the mirror, you know. Do, and they do that. And, and they're starting to ignore all their friends. Their friends will call and they just pass over the thing. I'm busy, I'm busy. How, how, are, you, how are you giving up all of this stuff? Because I, I want to spend time with this one. See, that's separated unto. We're supposed to be so in love with Jesus that the world just kind of blurs, just kind of fades away. It's like, well, I could be doing that, but I want to be doing this. I want to be after that. And you'll notice when somebody's in love like that, it's not a struggle for them to give up all that other stuff. 
because everything else fades away. Abraham never settled at the border. He was an all-in kind of guy. He either stayed in the land or he went all the way in, you know. He never settled on the border. He moved back into the land when God told him to. But here Isaac is going to dwell. And that's a bad word. He's going to abide at border town. Verse 7, And the men of that place asked him about his wife. And he said, She's my sister. Well, at least we've never seen that before, right? <sighs> For he was afraid to say, She is my wife, because he thought, At least the men of this place kill me, for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to behold. Satan and his tests do not change. They look the same yesterday, they look the same tomorrow, they look the same today. It's the same playbook, it's the same menu going after you. One thing we can learn is that Satan's ploys He's going to come after you with the same desires, the same lusts, the same stuff. But man's favorite response to those is a lie. Man's favorite response to when Satan throws something at us and we get a little scared and we get a little fearful, we, we throw a lie in there thinking, well, that's the easy way out. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be okay. It's going to work out that way. But Isaac's answer is a full-blown lie. She's nowhere near his sister. At least with Abraham, that was a half-truth. Here, it's not even that. It's just a, just a lie. But notice he has the same thoughts that his dad did. Rebecca's a looker, and, and they're going to come after her, and if I get in the way, they're going to kill me, so I can't be in the way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step aside. Oh, what, a, what a foolish thing. You know, Rebecca's no spring chicken anymore. We're going to find out she's 70, 80, 100 years old. Fathers, if you run, your kids will learn to run. Your kids will follow you. If you lie, they learn to lie. You, if you choose to stand, oh, oh, they may actually choose to stand. We know our kids <clears throat> that stuff is more caught than taught. You know, you're telling them, do this and do this and do this, but they're watching you. Do as I do and not as I say never works. Never works. Because they're watching you. They're going to do what you do. So, it says in verse 8, now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked through the window and saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. I love the King James Version. She's sporting. They're sporting together. Are they playing touch football? You know? What? They're sporting with each other. How long a time has it been? It says when they've been there a long time. The king looks out and he sees Isaac caressing his sister. Well, that's not right. They shouldn't be, you know, that's, that's weird. Apparently, they're not brother and sister, right? Verse 9, Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously, quite obviously, she's not, she's your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I said, least I die on account of her. Isaac admits, he just stands up and he goes, well, I lied because I was scared. I appreciate that about him. He doesn't try to bury it or justify himself or do any of that stuff. He just says, well, here's where I was. On the other hand, he's an absolute fool, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church 
and gave himself for her. It's not your life that you're worried about. It's her life that you're supposed to be worried about. Here's this, here's these issues, right? He set aside, you're my wife, you're my wife. Oh, suddenly you're not my wife because I'm in danger. <laughs> We're not supposed to think about ourselves, husband. We're supposed to think about them. We're supposed to enter their world and die there for them. As Christ entered our world and died there for us. That's, that's an amazing example. Good luck working that out, you know? Abimelech and the Philistines in this little passage are more righteous than Isaac was. And they are more righteous than America is today. Because they say, if adultery, if we do this adultery thing, it brings guiltiness upon our nation. It brings guiltiness. Notice what Abimelech says in verse 10. He says, and Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. Boy, where did that go? Where has that gone in America? The idea of guilt from some sexual sin. Even good old heterosexual American sin. Sorry, still sin. Still absolutely wrong. And it brings guilt on a nation. But it's always humiliating. I don't know if you know this firsthand. It's always so humiliating when the world convicts a Christian, a God-loving, God-fearing person of being an idiot, <laughs> of being, where'd that go? I thought you were supposed to be like this, and you turn out like that. So Abimelech charged all his people and said, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac is more willing to believe this pagan leader than he is to believe God who just appeared to him and says, I've got you. Move back in the land. I'll take care of you. I'll bless you. He's still on border town. He's still unsure. He's still, well, I can trust this guy now. Can you? Because that's just his word. This other is God's word. Which one are you going to live in? I've told you, no reason to fear. I have you. I'm going to bless you. If you stay in the land, and he's right on that edge. But Isaac, like most of us, still growing in faith, right? Still growing in this trusting and believing and understanding the Lord. Verse 12, then Isaac sowed in the land <clears throat> and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, so the Lord blessed him. First mention of farming here, you know. The famine's beginning to let up. The rain is coming back into the land, so it's time to sow, it's time to reap. And the Lord brings a bumper crop. For every one seed you plant, a hundred seeds come up. For every one dollar you invest, a hundred dollars comes up. That's, that's a good investment. I'm looking for that investment. That's a, that's a good one. I like that. And he blesses in spite of Isaac, not because of Isaac. How many of Isaacs are sitting in the room? How many times has God blessed in spite of you? <laughs> for me, every time. I don't know about you. That's how the Lord deals with me, in spite of me, not because of me. Oh, Mark had a really good day. Boy, that would be a banner day, right? Verse 13, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. <laughs> I wonder what the purpose of that verse is, prosper, prospering, prosperous, you know. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great numbers of servants. <clears throat> So the Philistines envied him. Isaac has access to the same land, to the same amount of sunshine, to the same amount of rain as his neighbors have, and his crop is blessed, and theirs is not so much blessed. 
and the neighbors get envious. I don't know if this ever happened to you either. The only difference is that God is with Isaac. God is for Isaac. He has a promised blessing on his life. But how can God, do you ever hear this? How can God bless a liar, a cheater like Isaac? You know, got somebody who's living on the edge and somebody who's lying about his wife and doing all of these things. How can God possibly bless a deceiver like that? Because God is faithful to his promise. The only condition on God's promise, stay in the land. Has Isaac stayed in the land? Yes. Is the blessing coming? Yes. That was God's word. But notice in the story, he does confess. Oh, I was worried about you. I was in fear about you. And therefore, I lied like this. He confesses his sin, opens the door of blessings for us. You know, Proverbs 24, 16, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. But with the wicked, they shall fall by calamity. So Christian perfection, again, is not that of performance. It's not that you're living a perfect life. It's that of having a perfect relationship. I'm a son of God, not because I did anything, but because God the Son came down and died for me. And I came by faith to that. And now I have this perfect relationship with God. Whenever you prosper in any way in this world, you will find that the envious Philistines will gather around those people who don't understand God's amazing grace. I'm just as good as him. He, I heard him cursing out in the, in the garage the other day, and I, I saw him doing stupid things, and I, you know, and they don't understand why you're getting blessed and they're not. Verse 15, Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they filled them in with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are mightier, you are much mightier than we are. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. Isaac's material blessings almost become a snare, almost become a place where he trips up. Because they're going to bring some burdens, they're going to bring some battles to his life. The Philistines want him gone. Get him out of here. He's taken all the best land. And, you know, I could have had that section of land. And then he, he moved there and I wanted. And, you know, they get into all these little things. When Abraham had died, the Philistines had a covenant with Abraham. They would leave his land alone. They would leave his wells alone. When he dies, they go and fill in all of his wells. And here's Isaac. Here's poor Isaac trying to live in the same place. No wells. Our sin, like Isaac lying to these Philistines, our sin will cause those around us to dig up a little dirt on us. Right? They start throwing a little mud, doing some work. They're blocking the wells of your life. Our old friends, they, they can't understand how you could ever be blessed. I grew up with that jerk, you know? And here he is, you know, he's all high and mighty, and he's doing this, and he's talking like that. And, you know, I've been blessed. I've been forgiven. I've been set free. That's God's grace. It's not because I did anything, necessarily. It's not because I changed it. He changed me. Everything that happened to me as a Christian, he did. And some of them are still going to dig up dirt on you and remind you of your past and, you know, of your sin. And they're trying to block the way of living water into your life. Now, Isaac had great herds, great flocks. They desperately need water out in this desert land. 
And the king comes and tells him, we need you guys to move. We need you guys to leave. You know, your family, are you listening to this? Your family has been greater, has become greater than our kingdom, than the whole Philistines' kingdom. <laughs> That's amazing. So he obeys. Okay, okay, I'll get out of town. And what's he do? He moves down to the valley. Boy, that's a big move, right? That's like the longest move I ever made in my life, like seven miles, you know? It's a, so like, there it is. He moves all the way down into the valley. I want to obey, sort of. I still want to stay close to the edge. And in verse 18... And Isaac dug again the wells of the water which he had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he called them by the names which his father had called them. So they start digging up these wells again. Ah, this is about the place. I think this is the place where dad had that well. And they start digging. And they go down and they reach water. And they call it by the same names Abraham called them. I remember when dad dug this well, and this is what it was, and this is the blessing we got out of this place. Verse 19, also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water. They're living water, bubbling water, however you want to picture this. It's, it's like they found an underground river of sorts. It's fresh water, it's clean water. The difference between that and most of the wells in the Middle East, most of the wells are like a cistern. They kind of, water seeps in, but then everything falls on it. And you get a big old scoop of water out of some of these, and it's got your protein and your water in it, you know? And you just, you drink it all down because it's good for you. But living water is actually moving. It's, it's actually got, you know, it's the kind of water I would prefer to drink. So they start digging these wells, and it's so interesting because Isaac becomes the man of the well. Seven times specifically, you're going to find him by a well of water. And Isaac's servants dug, and they found this running water, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac or quarrel, you know, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one, so he called the name Sitna. You know, I, I love this, you know, one of these is quarreling, and one of these is enmity, you know, we're at war, there's a battle over this place. Verse 19, nope, that's not right. Verse 22, and he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called the name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. They finally find this place where there's no quarrel. There's room. Oh, we found a place that we can dwell, where we can hang out. I like it because he kind of prophesies over this place. The Lord has made room for us and the Lord's going to make us blessed here. He's going to bless us in this place. While Abraham and Isaac have many things in common, they're also extremely different. When the people of Gerar came after Abraham's wells, Abraham went to them, went to their boss, went to Abimelech and said, hey, <laughs> we got an issue over this well, and it's mine. I dug it. He stood up for it, and he took it. It was his. Isaac is the kind of guy who doesn't want the conflict. You got to remember who Isaac is. He's the guy who went with his dad up to Mount Moriah and allowed himself to be sacrificed there. He's the guy who allowed his father to send the servant to go get his wife, and he just figures, well, that's my wife. He's the kind of guy that's just assuming when God does something, then it's all going to fall into place, and when he doesn't do something, then it ain't, and I'll just move on until he does. 
they're so different, and yet God uses both of those approaches. God can use both of those personalities. We need to be prayerful about how God wants us to respond, but he can use your personality. He's using these guys as personalities. You know, James 3.17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. So we want pure wisdom, then peaceable. Don't you love that? Peaceable. Then gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of the righteous, uh, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, and that's Isaac's description here. He's just he just wants peace. Just get me into a place where I'm going to be at peace, and that's going to be cool. Now, wells in the Bible, they awful, often speak of spiritual blessing, a place of spiritual depth, of, of spiritual life. And our lesson here may be telling us to dig up the old wells, the old ones that your fathers had, that the fathers had, the church fathers had, these ones that go way back, you know, the church so often today wants something brand new and shiny. Give me the, the drums and the flashy lights and the screens and the this and the that. And we want brand new stuff. But can I just tell you that life is found in the old deep wells of Christianity. The well of prayer. Oh, man, the well of worship. The well of faith. The well that there's power in the spirit, in the blood. You know, most of the modern church wants, don't want to mention blood at all. Let's get that out of here, you know. I'm sorry, that has to be in here. Of the sacrifice and of the service. The well of the fountain called sin. We're still going to that? We're still dealing with that in our lives, you know? The, the well of repentance. The well of living waters. You know, the culture around us has been filling those wells with dirt the whole time. They're throwing in compromise. They're throwing in all kinds of nonsense in there. So you can't get down in there. What's our job? Keep those things cleaned out. Keep those waters flowing. Keep that stuff coming into our lives. That's our task. We don't need to discover new and cool things. We need a legacy. We need that fountain of living water. We have a source of water to return to that nobody else on the planet has. It brings love. It brings joy. It brings peace. It brings hope. It brings new life. In times like now in America, in our world, <clears throat> the people need reality. Not some show, not some make-believe thing. They need to see reality in people's lives. Reality that these people are different. These people have been changed. These people are not just the, the same guy I knew back in high school, you know. They need truth. They need to hear about the gospel of grace. They need to hear about Jesus and his willingness to give them that same living water. So in verse 23, it says, Then he went up from there to Beersheba. He's finally coming back on track. He's finally getting back into the land. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Beersheba means it's the oath. It's the well of the oath or the, or the well of seven 
Abraham made a covenant with Abimelech. And remember, Abimelech's not a name. Abimelech's a title like Pharaoh. Um, at this place. But he's back on solid ground, so to speak. He's back in the place where God can actually come to him and talk to him. Say, hey, you're doing great. Let's do this. Let's move on. So the Lord appears. He says, do not fear. Why? Because I am with you. I'm the ever-present one. You're mine. I'm with you. You don't have to worry about that. It's not like I'm going to step out of the room or anything. So Isaac builds an altar here. He pitches his tent Secondly, notice that order, very interesting order. And then they dug a well. Now, it becomes kind of his homestead, if you will. This is the place where he's really going to settle down for a while. His tent reminds us that he is a pilgrim, right? Now, a fugitive is fleeing from a home. A vagabond has no home. A stranger is away from home, but a pilgrim, he's headed for home. So his altar should remind us that he has a future and a hope. He's looking forward. Like his father who was looking for that city whose builder and maker was God, not going to find it down here on this planet. It's it's something else. So he has a connection with that next world. He's plugged into there. He knows that's vital. He knows the blood of the lamb is what brings that relationship. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. Does that, does that sound like you? Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Verse 26, he says, Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with whatever that guy's name is, the guy with the Z's in the middle of his name, uh, and one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army, and said to Isaac, and Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? Isaac, knowing the Lord's with him, knowing God has me, now he confronts these guys. Now he does. He's back at peace. He's back in a place where he's got room. He's back where Abraham had been, and he, he's got a little confidence in the Lord here. He says, you guys hated me. You kicked me out of my place. You filled in all my wells. What's going on with you guys? Now you want peace with me? Now, understand, he's doing this. He's speaking the truth in love. He cares for them. He wants to be a good witness to them. And Isaac's conduct during this whole period of time is wonderful. Because these guys look at him and go, he's never really caused a problem, even though we drove him clear out of here. He never fought us, and never came. He just moved on until God blessed him in a place. And these men watch that and they go, man, that, that's just like Abraham was. He is just, you know, he's getting blessed just like Abraham did. There's, there's the hand of God is on this guy. Verse 28, but they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. Can your neighbors say that? Just a question. You know. That's why you come here, just so I can question you like that, right? So we said, let us now make an oath between us and between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you, really? And since we have done nothing to you, really? But good. You know, we've done nothing but good. We've been nothing but good to you and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made a feast, and they ate, and they drank. They settled this matter of the land. They settled this matter of the wells. They settled this matter. It's interesting to me that they can't mention Isaac's walk, Isaac's life, without mentioning Isaac's God. Hmm. That's a great thing. They are inseparable. When you watched Isaac, you saw God. You saw his hand. 
the idea of eating together, you know, having this feast. In the Middle East, if you had an enemy, you did not break bread with that enemy. You don't even share a drink with that enemy. You may give him a drink, but you don't share a drink. But to sit down and eat from the same table and eat from the same stuff and break the same bread, you're saying, you're my friend. So they leave this place as friends. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath to one another. Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass on that same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water, so they called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of that city is called Beersheba to this day. They, that same day, the same day that peace comes with the surroundings and they make this oath, they discover Beersheba, the same well that Abraham made this covenant with. It's the oath of seven, the covenant that Abraham had. Verse 34, and when Isaac was 40 years, when Esau, sorry, Isaac, Esau's son, now 40 years old, he took wives, Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and Bezamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of mine to Isaac and Rebekah. You know, peace in one area of your life doesn't guarantee peace in the next. <laughs> Have you noticed that? You know? Esau, their son, oldest son, you remember Harry, you know, from last week. Harry begins to marry these pagan women, and he notices that when he marries these pagan women, it ticks mom and dad off. So what's he go do? Later, he's going to go marry another one, you know, just to put a little icing on the cake, you know. Life um, comes in all kinds of sorts, all kinds of issues. So we need to choose our battles, right? We need to learn to find peace and satisfaction in the Lord and not in our surroundings, not in the world, not in what our kids are doing, not in, you know, our peace, the only place you're going to find peace in this life is in him. <laughs> because our sons and daughters, I don't know if you've noticed this about kids, but they're going to make their own choices. Now it's our job to train them up in the way they should go. We need to admonish them. We need to train them. We need to do all of this stuff. But, you know, when it comes to a certain time in their life, it's their choice. And some of them choose well, and some of them choose to be difficult. We've heard all the excuses, you know. Well, I can't find any. There's no Christian boys that go to our church, you know. There, there's no Christian girls, you know. There's this and there's that. We, we get in all those things, you know. Well, at least th this one's more godly than those other ones out there. And, who are, you know, and you get into these places where we've heard all of the, you know, excuses. But then we see the fallout that comes by marrying an unbeliever, comes by marrying a misbeliever, comes by marrying a different, you know, thing. And there's fighting over religions, there's fighting over children, there's fighting over families, there's, there's you know, and I just want to spare you that. 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? You know, what communion has light with darkness? You know, you got to be headed the same way. You got to have the same goals. You got to be in the same boat, go in the same direction, you know? What accord has Christ with Belial? You know, here Isaac loves his son, but he never seems to have taken a stand with his son and said, son, this is what you need to do. This is what would be best for you. You know, his son, his dad, Abraham, sent away for his bride, you know, ordered her from Russia or something, you know, it's not that. But uh, he, he, he helped that process. Here, Isaac doesn't seem to do that. You know, I know some parents who think the right way to love their kids is to not do anything, not, not uh, punish them, not discipline them, not correct them, you know, just let them live 
That's, that's love. And I know some of these kids, and they're an absolute nightmare. We, we, it's our job to teach them to honor and obey. Now, verse 27, chapter 27, as we get into this, it's like the worst day in your family ever, and then it's recorded. It's recorded for millions to look into, to, to look around. It's that Kodak moment. Aren't you glad God stopped doing that? You know? What well, would you like to have your worst day? Just record it out like this day is, you know? We find deceit, cheating, lying, you know, <laughs> conniving. We find all of those things. God writes it out for us so that we can learn from it. Now, this chapter takes place 30 years after chapter 26. So get this. Verse 27, or chapter 27, 1. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapon and your quiver and your bow and go out in the field and hunt game for me and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Isaac, he's 137 years old. That's the same age that his brother Ishmael died at. So is he, is he sitting around thinking, well, well, I got this family, you know, this seems to be the thing in the family. I got the same DNA, maybe I'm getting close to death. Is he just having one of those bummed out days? You know what that's like? Oh, I don't think I'm going to live much longer, you know? You ever have someone in your family like that? Oh, I think today's the day, you know? They got the Fred Sanford in the, in the crowd. It's the big one. <laughs> I'm going to die. Today's the day, you know? It's like he's on death row, and he's ordering his last meal from his son. <laughs> Would you go out and hunt the game and bring me my favorite stuff, you know? Now, Isaac knows that the blessing is to go to Jacob, but here he's trying to give it to Esau. Has Isaac cooled over the years? Um... Are you as hot as you were with the Lord at certain times? Or have you cooled? You know? Or as we say, matured. You know? It takes work to stay hot. It takes work to stay in the flame, you know? There's reading, there's prayer, there's service, there's love, there's, there's all of these things. Spending time. We're going to find that Isaac is deceived by his senses in this chapter. The only true thing that he has in this chapter is his hearing, and he doesn't trust his hearing. His eyes are going to fail him. His touch is going to fail him. The smell is going to fail him. And he's going to mistrust the hearing. The trouble is... It's the spoken word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, that's your lifeline. That's our lifeline. This guy is in the place where, I don't know if you've ever been there, I just feel like this. It just seems like the whole world's against me, and I feel like it's the end, and I feel, and I feel, and I feel. We must not be deceived by our senses. We're to be standing in truth and for truth. I don't care if it doesn't feel right to you. If God has told you to do it, you need to do it. And, you know, what does truth say? Do that. Because if you bring your behavior into submission to God's word, your feelings will fall in line. So what's driving Isaac in this chapter? In this chapter, we're going to read about that tasty game seven times, meat six times, eating six times. <laughs> 
Isaac's all about his flesh right here. Feed me Seymour, you know? And he doesn't just wake up one day and decide to give the blessing to Esau. He's been chewing on this for a while because we all know it's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. It's piece by piece and part by part. So verse 5, it says, Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau his son, and Esau went into the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speaking to Esau your brother, saying, Bring me game and savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Hmm. Did you notice in verses 5 and verse 6, I was listening to Esau, his son, and in verse 6, so Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son. <laughs> what have they learned from Abraham and Sarah? Abraham and Sarah, two sons. Cast out that bomb woman's son. And they had a favorite son. And in Isaac and Rebekah's home, they have a favorite son. What a dysfunctional family that's placed here before us. What we miss here is mom. She hears the whispering going on in the other room, you know. She's got the glass up to the door, and she, and, and she runs over, and she gets Jacob, and she goes, now my son, Jacob, Little Jakey, this is what I need you to go do. Little Jakey is 70 years old. I want you to listen to me about this. I want you to follow what I tell you. Some moms haven't got the memo yet. You're to raise your children to let them go. <laughs> In the, Old, in the Old Testament, you know, a, a child was in the mother's care until they were 13 years old. Bar, bar mitzvah, bas, bas, mis, bas, whatever that thing's called. Then those, chi, those children were turned over to the father who trained them to get along in the real world. But they're so harsh and you're being so mean. Yeah, they better learn that if they're going out here. You know, there's some hard things. And once you left the home, the parents backed off and you were the adult. And they were simply counselors if you ask for counsel. <laughs> but today, but today, we have this whole generation. Since I was a child, you know, 60 years ago, I made, you know, I got married at 17 years old. I started working at 15, you know. I, you, you get all of these things going on. Today, in our culture, in America, the average male does not make his first adult decision until he's 28 years old. Because he doesn't have to make that decision sitting down in mom's basement. Mom, give me a burger! You don't, don't need to make those decisions. We're supposed to be raising our children to grow up, to move out, to get into life, you know? They're never going to do that, living in your basement, you know, with you providing everything they've ever needed. Verse 9. Now, here's her advice. The good old little Jakey, you know. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food for them, from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it, and he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, um, Ma, how's this supposed to work? I love this. Look, Esau, my brother's a hairy guy, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps Dad's going to feel me or something. What in the world? How are we going to do this? Rebecca. She's the one who knows Jacob is supposed to get the blessing. 
So let's outsmart but dad. Dad's trying to go around the back door and do something wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, both parents are totally wrong here. God's the only right one here. The older is going to serve the younger. That's his promise. So mom and dad need to step back and let God do his thing. Mom's saying, we've got biblical reasons to do, you know, to, to lie and to deceive and to cheat. We've got biblical reasons because God told me that this needs to be that way. <laughs> you fool. You know? What, how much could Rebecca have learned from Sarah? She died before she came on the scene. But Sarah, Sarah submitted to Abraham. Even at times where I just shake my head and go, man, I can't believe she submitted to that. She just submits. And she submits even after finding out that Abraham is just human. Just a guy. <laughs> How shocking it is when wives discover that their husband is just mere human. You know? It usually takes place shortly after the I do's take place. <laughs> But here's the thing, mother knows best. I don't know whoever wrote that. I don't know who said that, but that is not biblical. You know? God does not need your help, mom. Dad, God doesn't need your help. So verse 11, I love that. Jacob says, look, Esau, my brother, he's hairy. I'm smooth. How's this going to work out? In verse 12, perhaps my father will feel me and I will seem to be a deceiver. I don't care if I'm a deceiver. I just don't want to seem to be a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother says to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go and get them for me. Now, I don't mind being a deceiver, Jacob says. I just don't want to be caught at being a deceiver. It's that old story of sin. If I go into the supermarket and I actually steal that Snickers bar, that makes me a thief. That makes me a sinner. That's a lie. No, you're already a sinner. That action simply proves you're a sinner. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all natural born sinners. So she says, well, if you get caught, let that curse be upon me. You know, I'll step in there and he can curse me. You know, she, think, she still thinks she's justified by trying to do God's work. No, it's God's promise. Let him do God's work. How is she submitting to her husband? How is she submitted to the Lord? She's not either of those things. Now what she doesn't understand is the consequences of her actions. Because she's going to be found out later this day. And there's going to be this friction, right? Esau is going to want to kill Jacob because he, he stole and she's going to say, why don't you go visit my brother, you know, Laban, back in the old country. You know, why don't you travel 900 miles away, and you'll be safe there for a few days, and after a few days, you can come back home. Well, that few days turns into a few weeks, and then into a few months, and then into 21 years. And she dies in that 21 years. And they never see each other here on planet Earth again. And the last thing she told her son lie cheat and steal <laughs> I hope you understand that no matter how old you are you never need to listen to someone who's telling you to lie cheat and steal no matter how godly they seem to be or what reasons they seem to have You don't need to listen to your mom. You don't need to listen to your dad. You don't need to listen to your husband or to your wife. 
Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and upon his law he meditates day and night. That kind of guy is going to be like a tree planted by rivers of water, by that well, that running water well. He's going to be like a tree planted right there, who brings forth his fruit in his season. And his leaf, even in the harshest of famines, will not wither. Hmm. But the ungodly are not so. We're going to have to stop here right in the middle. We've just got the setup for the whole story. I'll try to remind you next week. But it's a great chapter. Read ahead. Just fascinating stuff going on here. Lord, we all come from dysfunctional families. <coughs> we all have harsh dads and overstepping moms and, you know, people meddling with us, filling in wells where we don't want them filled in and, you know, not giving us room. And yet, Lord, as your sons and daughters, we have you. You'll never leave us or forsake us. You, prom you promise to bless and to be with and to walk with. And God, we need to simply dig those wells, plant our trees right there, and let you bring the fruitfulness. Let you bring the prosperity, bring the blessedness, bring the whatever it is you're going to bring as we trust in you, as we, you know, don't walk in their counsel, as we don't stand in the path, as we don't sit in that seat, but as we wrap ourselves up in your word, in your law, in your ways. Lord, cause us to be those trees. Bring that depth. Bring those living waters. Lord, stir them within us that we might grow and be fruitful for you and in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.